that God has created us and God has given to us, when it goes away, they are sorry and they have like a, they cry a little bit. So, so um, <clears throat> this is a special day for us and it's the beginning of our Creation Science Weekend. And uh, just one question, a little question first. What is the, like, what's the best aspect of, what's the aspect of creation that you enjoy most? When you think about all crea God's creation, all his, uh, the things he's made, what is something you enjoy most? Sabbath. Sabbath, okay. What else? Anything else? My wife. My wife, okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Oxygen. Oxygen, yes. God created oxygen too, okay. The ocean. The ocean, okay. One more. Science. <laughs> okay. So yeah, there's many things God gives. God created so many things that no matter who you are, what personality, what identity or interest you have, that there's something for you to enjoy. Because because of this, you can live, and we can also study and learn more about God's creations. And so we're going to be enjoying a lot of uh, great knowledge from many people, including Dr. Kevin this morning, uh, this evening, I should say. <laughs> and uh, we're going to uh, also have many people tomorrow as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and start with uh, one special song to welcome the Sabbath. Um, the song is called um, uh, This Is My Father's World. And so let's open your songbooks to number 92, is that right? Number 92, is that right? It's also on the screen. Good evening, happy Sabbath. And I'm so happy to have you here. And uh, I really appreciate this weekly reminder. And God give us, you know, so um, when we, every time we enter the Sabbath, we know that uh, we do have a creator. Amen. Right? So uh, before I started to pray, I just want to read it in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. It, uh, it said, They know the truth about God because he has made it obviously to them. Forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his internal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Amen? Is that beautiful? Let's just bow ahead to prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you very much for this beautiful Sabbath evening. 
when we put aside everything and come to your temple to worship you, and we know you are here, Lord, and we acknowledge you are the God who created us. Lord, and more than that, you also have rede redeemed us. And this evening and this weekend, when we all come together, we are trying to explore, to understand the beauty of creation from different perspectives. Lord, may you guide us and may you give us your wisdom. Then we'll be able to understand how great thou art. Lord, be with us tonight and be whoever here join us in person or those who join us online. Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak into our heart, especially when you prepare uh, our speaker tonight. And may you give him your words. And we all can be blessed tonight. Thank you so much, Lord, for what you have done in our life. And thank you for what you are going to do tonight. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share just a very little bit of a background before our speaker comes up. Um, for many years, um, I've been working on, um, I, I've been sharing with God about God's principles and things, witnessing online and face to face. And when we go to meet people who are non Christians, um, many times the first thing they ask is about, why do you believe in creation? <laughs> and so in 2 Peter 3, it talks about how there's going to be a deliberate denial of creation at the end of, the time, at the end of our world. And about two months ago, I found a study that said that now when people, when people don't know the evidence for creation, that it is the biggest reason why they give up faith. But when they know evidence for creation, it is very strong in keeping their faith strong. And so I thought, oh, this is really important. We need to have a conference. And I began talking to some professors at the university and saying, hey, can we work on a creation conference together to make our, um, help our members' faith be stronger? And many of them said, yes, it's very important. And they joined us. And so I was very glad to see that. And one of them was Dr. Kavanagh. <laughs> and uh, I believe he's a physicist, but he also has a very deep interest in philosophy. And he shared some papers with me. And I read through his papers, and they were really uh, unique um, in several ways. But one way was he was saying that creation and the faith that we have is based on very rational logic grounds. And the deceivers, the deceptions in the world, they are not following fair ways of reasoning. And, and they're not very objective. And they're using fallacies and things like that. And so, I was very interested in that, and I asked him to share, and, and he was very kind and gracious to do so. And so um, and, um, he shared with a little bit about his bio, uh, background. He said uh, he graduated from Southern Adventist University and received a PhD in physics at the University of Lowell, Massachusetts, and specialized in special and general relativity, which is Einstein's field, right? <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> so uh, he taught at Estee Universities in Rwanda, Texas, and Tennessee, and now he is the chair of physics and engineering at Southern. He also enjoys finding explanations that make sense to students and loves seeing the flash of understanding in their eyes, the eureka. I understand moments. I like that too. I've been a teacher for many years. I love that. It's hard when they don't understand you very well. <laughs> uh, so, and he, outside of class, he, he studies languages. Oh, which languages do you speak, by the way? He said six languages, I think. How, which languages? French, German, some Spanish, Russian, and Esperanto. Okay, very good. So you can teach language classes in addition to physics and philosophy. <laughs> but anyway, we're very happy to have Dr. Kevin is here, and I hope you listen with him and open your minds to what God is going to say through his uh, lecture and his talk to us. Thank you very much. As you can see, the topic for tonight is faith and science. And that's not faith versus science, but in fact, working together. And uh, I'm glad to be with you tonight, uh, starting out the theme, Creation Matters. And it does. Creation does matter. So first of all, I'd like to just uh, give a little background introduction. I teach at Southern Adventist University. And uh, many of you know this area. We've got the picture uh, taken from a drone above, and we have Wright Hall, the standard look of, of, uh, of Southern, and Hickman Science Center there on the, on the right side. And that's my home, away from home, in that building, ground floor. And I like to say physics is the foundation of the sciences, so the other sciences will be on the other floors. 
So much of the material that I'd like to share with you tonight comes from uh, out of working with these issues in a class called Issues, Issues in Physical Science and Religion, which I've taught for several years. And it's a class where we ask hard questions about science and religion. And we, we think, we think carefully, we consider the issues. And I would say if a student graduates from our schools without having carefully thought through their, their worldview, we have failed in the educational process. We need to, uh, we need to carefully reason. In fact, uh, in Isaiah, the prophet says, come, let us reason together. We are not supposed to just move on, but we need to think carefully. Uh, my interest in these issues ha has led to my giving presentations in Switzerland, Germany, Argentina, Moldova, and some of those were not in English. Uh, so you can see a couple of things here uh, in different languages. Uh, and then one of the high points, I would say, was when I was asked to, um, to give uh, some presentations on the campus of the Ukrainian Adventist Center for Higher Education. So just outside Kiev, and this was before the Russian invasion, uh, but uh, we, we really enjoyed this time. And in fact, do we need both? Okay. Uh, yeah, I got, the, I got this too. Um, in fact, every student on that campus had to be in one or another of my science and religion classes. I gave uh, presentations every week in different groups. And it was amazing to just be able to focus on these questions. A real high point for me. So as we start thinking about faith and science, I would like to start with this well-known expression. Houston, we have a problem. Well, I should mention this comes from uh, an erroneous quote, and uh, you see here Tom Hanks on the screen uh, from uh, the movie Apollo 13. Well, he didn't quite say it the way we say it now, but Houston, we have a problem. That's an expression you'll hear. In fact, you'll hear various versions of it. Here's one, Houston, we have no problem. And uh, I guess that's a statement of confidence. We're, we're good, we're doing fine. Uh, in fact, sometimes I wonder, some people act like with Houston, with science, with our technology, that is the reason we have no problems. And that is a fantastically, uh, what, that's a strong statement of faith. And I personally cannot accept that. I would say, there are problems. Some people show such faith in science that they think that's the only way to learn or the only way to, to arrive at truth. And that is a misguided statement of faith. So there are people who see this, this uh, conflict between science and religion. Some people view that science is the problem. Some of our dear saints in the church feel they view with suspicion. I've even heard uh, some dear uh, fellow church members say, well, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't study science because that's dangerous. You might lose your faith. Whereas, um, well, it's on both sides because there are people who, who uh, use science as their guide who are very suspicious of religion. So there is a dichotomy and we've got the line down the middle of the road. You either are on the science track or the religion track. And uh, there is a perception that these are incompatible. So this is a little cartoon to show the difference, according to some people, between science and faith. So science, we have a very regular, logical, careful process. You see the flow chart, everything spelled out. Now, it's too small to read. Don't worry about it. But the idea is everything is specified. We have the step-by-step -step process. We, have, we know what we're doing, and we do our experiments, we test our theories, and we um, cycle through, and we gain knowledge. This is the idea. 
Now, the poster continued and shows what some people say the religious method is. And this is what I want to focus on for a second. Religion or faith, according to some people who do not agree with our faith. And those three are still a little too small to read, but there is get an idea, and the second is ignore any conflicting data or evidence, and then the third is search for, discover more evidence, and then still ignore the things you don't like. Now that's sad. That's really sad. I do not think that's how people of faith operate. But this is the view, uh, the uh, warfare view between science and religion. And both sides are guilty of uh, exaggerating and misunderstanding, I would say. A couple others. Uh, this this uh, billboard, science will fly you to the moon, but religion will fly you into a building. And of course, the reference is uh, to 9-11, the, the Twin Towers. Well, this is making uh, several mistakes. One is to conflate or confuse all different religions and place them all in one category. But also, uh, this, it's just not that simple. Science will lead us to, to uh, progress, and religion will tear it down. That, this is the view that some people have. Again, showing the warfare model between science and religion, science versus religion. And we have even t-shirts to advertise the war. Science speaks of facts without having absolute certainty. Well, actually, it's good not to claim more certainty than we know. Sometimes it's good to be a little tentative. This is what we, we have evidence, but we don't have proof. And then the t-shirt goes on, religion speaks of absolute certainty without having facts. Again, very sad uh, comparison, and I don't agree with it, but it highlights this versus science versus religion. So I would say the truth about the, the arguments of science and religion is there is a lot of fear and hostility on both sides. And there, it is fueled by various misunderstandings, miscommunication, frequent incorrect statements, and most of all, different assumptions. So, and different worldviews, coming at it from a different point of view, and unwillingness to see another person's point of view. Uh, we, we feel threatened. We are unwilling to learn. And we should... We should work on fixing this. Uh, we feel most threatened by things we don't understand, and the fact is, science and religion coexist very well. And I can show you that from history, because science not only can be done by Christians, but it, through most of history, science has been done by Christians. In fact, science is based on the biblical worldview. So I know we don't put things on the Bible, but you, you get the uh, view here that science is actually, the worldview of science is actually built on the biblical foundation. And this is how we teach our classes also, the emphasis on a biblical foundation. It is the atheistic, materialistic presuppositions of some of, many of today's scientists that disagrees with Christianity not science itself. So I hope to clarify that a little bit. Again, the best proof that something can be done is to do it. And science was invented by Christians. It was the belief in an eternal, changeless, loving and reasonable God that led scientists to expect that his creation would be understandable. So, here are four different worldviews. If you start with animism, so this is the belief that there are multiple spirits. Uh, it's, not, it's not advancing here. Oh. Mm. There, my PowerPoint was supposed to uh, pop up some little explanations here, but the, the upper left corner animism this is their spirits in everything and they frequently uh, there's no overarching 
pattern. You have the spirit of the stream and the spirit of the forest and the spirit of the uh, big rock and the uh, spirit of the wild animal. And science did not develop in that sort of worldview, that sort of thinking. On the upper right, we have the gods of the, of the Greeks, the Romans, and similarly the gods of the of the Norse tradition, they were always fighting, there was infighting, there was disagreement, and actually they're, they're like uh, the worst of humans, you might say, powerful and um, unpleasant humans. Science d could not develop in that sort of a worldview. And then we have the Eastern view, where we doubt that even what we see is real. It's just uh, all in a in illusion. Science could not develop in that view. And then the last picture is to represent the idealistic thinking of the G Greek philosophers. Science actually didn't, didn't develop there either, even though we, th we like to say we base on our, our philosophy on this, uh, on this early uh, Greek thought, but actually they, they were very reluctant to go out and do experiments on the real world. <laughs> And, and see how it worked. So science did not arise from any of these, but it did arise in Europe in medieval times when there was an emphasis on the omnipotent, omnipotent God who created the world. And notice in Genesis 131, he's, he calls it very good. So if God made it and it's good, then it's worth studying. It's worth our time to learn about it, to study his creation. Nancy Percy writes in, the, in her piece, Christianity, Christianity is a science starter, not a science stopper. In other words, Christianity is not against science. It's actually the foundation. And she writes, in the biblical worldview, scientific investigation of nature became both a calling and an obligation. The rise of modern science cannot be explained apart from the Christian view of nature as good and worthy of study, which led early scientists to regard their work as obedience to God's mandate to till the garden. So they were given a job. Adam and Eve were given the job to take care of the world, but also they had to study it. Uh, this was part of it. And Eric Snow said, the worldview of Christianity was absolutely necessary for the, modern, the rise of modern science. So these aren't in opposition. Duhem and Yaki say, a direct, there is a direct connection between Christian metaphysics, so that's the, the, uh, our, whole, our whole understanding of how truth works and our thinking. Uh, there's a connection between Christian thinking and the birth of a self-sustaining science. So this is proof that you can do science and be a Christian. In fact, I'd almost say you couldn't have science without. Uh, in the words of Francis Schaeffer, who was one of the most powerful voices for rational Christian thinking and um, against the idea that if you're a Christian, then you, you aren't thinking, he wrote, modern science was started by, by Christians. Christianity was needed for the beginning of modern science for the simple reason that Christianity created a climate of thought which put men in a position to investigate the form of the universe. So without that, we might not have science. And another, another uh, place in the book, Escape from Reason, he wrote, the early scientists also shared the outlook of Christianity in believing that there is a reasonable God who created a reasonable universe, and so we, by the use of our reason, can find out how the universe works, find out the universe's form. So I would take it as an undeniable fact that modern science grew out of the Judeo-Christian view from the biblical uh, base. We might ask, is that cause and effect? And to me, it's reasonable. It's reasonable to say 
because you believe in one single God, not a multitude of incomprehensible gods, one single God, he created all of nature, but he created us too. He designed nature to operate according to logical patterns, comprehensible laws. And he also made man in his image with that creativity, the interest to understand, and also the ability to understand the logical works of God. This all allowed science to prosper. So, uh, when you put all this together, yes, science can coexist with, with our faith. And let's take a few quotes from some of the pioneers of science. Uh, Nicholas Copernicus, who famously said that the the sun doesn't go around the earth, instead the earth goes around the sun. A great uh, step forward in understanding astronomy. He said, it is the philosopher's endeavor to seek the truth in all things to the extent permitted to human reason by God. So this is your job, to use your reason as permitted by God to study uh, his creation and find truth. He also said, to know the mighty works of God, to comprehend his wisdom and majesty and power, to appreciate in degree, we, we, don't, we don't know everything, right? We should be a little humble. To appreciate in degree the working, wonderful workings of his laws, surely this must be a pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the Most High. So he says it's worship to study God's creation. Galileo perhaps one of the most famous uh, of all scientists, or, and sometimes called the father of science, said the prohibition of science would be contrary to the Bible, which in hundreds of places teaches us how the greatness and glory of God shine forth in all his works. And uh, just jumping down, there are such profound secrets and such lofty conceptions that the night labors and researches of hundreds and yet hundreds of the keenest minds in investigations extending over thousands of years would not penetrate them. There's so much to learn, so much to learn. And the delight of searching and finding endures forever. Galileo has has the same idea of heaven as I do. Constantly being able to study God's creation and learn more and more and more. I think this is what we'll be doing in heaven. Sometimes I, I tease my friends in the school of religion. I say, we won't need any pastors in heaven, you know. <laughs> but we'll still need scientists because we're all studying God's creation. So um, I don't know what they think of that. <laughs> So Galileo is quite a character. He says, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with senses, reason, intellect, has intended to forego their use and by some other means give us knowledge which we can attain by what he's given us. So he's saying, don't turn off your brain. God gave it to you. He gave it to you to use. And, of course, Galileo uh, was not blessed by any lack of self-confidence. He was convinced of God's greatness, but he was also convinced of Galileo's greatness. Uh, this is a cute little quote. Uh, I thank infinite God because he was so gracious to make myself, as the first observer of wonders, uh, treasures that for centuries have been hidden in the dark. Well, actually, it's quite true, but he shouldn't have said it. Uh, and the last quote from Galileo, uh, he, he says, the intention of the Holy Spirit is to teach us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go, which is kind of a little cute line. Uh, but it does say the Bible is there to bring us to God. It's not a science textbook, but it is the foundation of everything else. Let's move to Kepler. My wife won't let me tell you all about Kepler's three laws, but uh, it's the, uh, the explanation of the planetary orbits. How do the planets orbit around the sun? So three laws tell the shape, the speed, and the total period for each planet to go around the sun. Amazing, no one had ever done this before. Kepler was a genius. 
And he says, I feel carried away and possessed by an unutterable rapture over the divine spectacle of heavenly harmony. We see how God, like a human architect, approached the founding of the world according to order and rule. How he sees God, the God of order and very logical uh, laws of physics, laws of the universe that God has set up. And just like an architect would do things carefully, not just slap it together. This, this universe shows careful design. He also says, I was thinking God's thoughts after him. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, when the pastor speaks, I, I hope that he's sharing something that God revealed, thinking God's thoughts after him. But Kepler says, as we study nature, we're doing that too. In regard to the book of nature, it benefits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else, the glory of God. So this is an act of worship. Kepler says. Moving to Isaac Newton, perhaps the greatest of all scientists, the wonderful arrangement and harmony of the cosmos would only originate in the plan of an almighty omniscient being. What we see can only be explained by God. It is the perfection of God's works that they are all done with the greatest simplicity. He is the God of order and not confusion. That sends a chill up and down my spine when I read that. That is uh, an amazingly powerful statement about our God. Ironically, we also go, we um, can trace back to Newton the whole idea of putting God out of the equation. So the, uh, in Rosenblum, uh, we read, the most immediate impact of the Newtonian worldview was breaking up the physical from the spiritual, our Newtonian heritage. Uh, so Newton believed in God, and so he did science. But his followers said, oh, I now have the explanation. I don't need God anymore. Very sad. Very, very sad. So the synthesis of the physical and the spiritual, everything holistic, Newton certainly believed that, but his followers uh, used Newton's models and his thinking as an excuse to try to separate out. It was the very order and comprehensibility that Newton and others saw in nature as a result of God made it, which is now used to remove God from the equation. Actually, that's as silly as if I were to claim, just because I understand the theory of how a radio works, then a radio might just pop into existence uh, without a creator. Just because we can understand some of God's creation doesn't mean there wasn't a designer. In fact, I think it gives us even more reason to believe in design. Let's go back to some assumptions. We all see design in the universe around us. Things are planned, things are organized. But the, the theist, the believer, says those patterns are due to God's plan, God's design. The atheist would say, oh, there's a natural explanation, no supernatural. So that's, those are two diametrically opposed assumptions to explain the same design. If we're not aware of our assumptions, then we can just talk past each other. Again, uh, many people say the antagonism between science and religion is inevitable. And that's many people on both sides. Uh, some say science is necessarily against religion, anti-religious. And some say that religion is necessarily anti-intellectual. I might have believed that, except I read the books of Francis Schaeffer and saw that religion is not anti-intellectual. In fact, it's logical, uh, more logical than atheistic materialism. So I would say that, in, that antagonism is not inevitable. So let's, let's look at what science is and uh, start with a definition from one of the books I use in class. Science is provisional, gives tentative answers, the best we can find so far. It, is, it gives predictions and 
allows us to test our theories. It, is, it uh, involves observable, repeatable things. And the last in this list, wait for it, is only natural causes. And so this is where I have to beg to differ because that last piece requires anyone who believes in God to, to uh, check his or her belief at the door and say, I will for now not even think about the supernatural. Whereas science should not require that. Science should be find the best explanation. Often the, expl the best explanation we see is that God created. So if you follow this model, you are functionally acting like an atheist or at least a deist. Deism is a little different. A deist does believe God created, but then he walked off and just left it. Uh, so that is not the God that I believe in. And so that is not the kind of science I do either. So uh, this is only theists have to temporarily suspend their beliefs. Let's compare those worldviews. On the one side, the biblical worldview, on the other, the naturalistic or the materialistic worldview. And I would say the materialistic worldview is more, um, more limited and less open to uh, consider all options. And we are talking about an open system or a closed system. The, the materialistic worldview, everything is closed. You don't have anything outside that can uh, reach in. The theist, the believer, says, oh, God can intervene. Yes, there's a physical universe, and we study it. We understand the patterns. But anytime God wants, he can step in. The supernatural and the natural can coexist. Just because God set up a natural law doesn't mean that he is now forbidden to do anything. Natural law does not limit God, whereas the, the materialist, the naturalist, would say, uh, this explains everything, and we close our eyes to anything else, uh, nothing beyond the physical. And uh, this also makes me think of the, uh, well, both systems see the order and the patterns, but the open system allows the possibility of more. God is not limited by natural law. He can override whenever he wants. That would be called a miracle. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors and a, a speaker for Christianity, uh, gave this interesting, cute analogy. And one of my friends put together this part of the PowerPoint to kind of illustrate this. C.S. Lewis says, let me come to this, uh, suppose... You put sixpence, he was, in, he was British, okay? You put sixpence in your drawer today. And tomorrow, you put in another sixpence. Same drawer. The laws of arithmetic can tell you what you'll find when you open the drawer. Okay, six plus six is 12. The laws of arithmetic. Okay, that makes, makes sense. Provided there's no interference. But if a thief has been at the drawer... You may find something else. You may get a different effect. The thief will not have broken the laws of arithmetic. The thief will be breaking the, the law of the country. He says it will break only the laws of England. The laws of arithmetic describe how numbers function, but they cannot prevent this outside interference. The action of the thief is not prevented by the laws of arithmetic. Okay, that's a great illustration because it applies to the universe too. It applies to my drawer, but it also applies to the whole of nature. The laws of nature describe the regular patterns visible in the universe, but they do not prevent God's intervention, just like the laws of arithmetic don't prevent a thief from stealing some of my money, and then I don't, arithmetic doesn't describe it anymore. There will be a confusion when we have the mistaken assumption that my desk drawer and that the universe are closed systems. Actually, they're open. I think that's a better explanation. 
Another way to say the same thing is God, as the divine artist, cannot himself be bound by the constraints that govern his artistic painting. So, as a, I'm not an artist, but I, I am amazed and impressed by uh, artists' work, and they create a little world in their, in their art. And this may have some different laws of nature in this artistic world. The artist is not subject to those laws. The artist can do something in the, in the little universe, but is not required to be limited. And that, that applies to God. There are many good reasons, to, to uh, strong reasons, to believe in God's design. And let's just look quickly at some of the fine-tuning arguments. Uh, this, some of these are taken from the book The Privileged Planet, which was later turned into a film also, uh, by Gonzalez and Richards. It explores some of the extremely sensitive factors that make life possible on Earth. And there are many of them. Here are just a few. Earth's distance from the sun, distance from the moon, mass of the Earth, tilt of the Earth's axis, composition of the Earth's atmosphere, the average temperature, and the, the specific strength of the Earth's magnetic field. We could uh, have 10 times this many factors, and each of them tell me that the Earth is designed for our life. We, you change them, and we can't live here anymore. We die. This is evidence that the Earth was designed for life. Christians would say it's evidence that it comes from the hand of a loving and bountiful creator God. The materialist's view is something else. Oh, it was just a cosmic lottery. Somewhere the conditions would happen, and we were just lucky. Um, in fact, the probability of these factors happening all of them happening, are so abysmally low that we now have the multiverse theory. Okay, multiverse theory is there's more than one universe, we're in one universe, and it used to be, in fact, when I was young, it, people said there's so many galaxies and so many stars in each galaxy and so many planets orbiting each star in the galaxies, in, the, in, in all the galaxies, that somewhere we should have life. It should be very, um, uh, it, it, the probability should be very high. But those probabilities for all these factors to work have been, uh, we've been seeing they're more and more uh, difficult. Uh, we are special. We are a privileged planet. And so the multiverse model is to get more chances for chance to play a role. Uh, it, to me, it just shows how, how far uh, unbelievers will go to keep their unbelief. And uh, it's, it's not a sign of open thinking. But this is not the only evidence of design and fine-tuning. The fine-tuning of the universe is even more impressive to me. If any of the constants of nature, the strength of the different forces, strong nuclear, electromagnetic, weak nuclear, gravitational force, if these things were different, not only life on Earth wouldn't exist, the universe would not exist. Uh, galaxies would not exist. Stars could not exist. Any of these things are so carefully fine-tuned. A tiny change would make the entire universe impossible. And the believer would say, clearly, God designed it. Uh, in, and the atheist must make these unsupported claims to a multiverse in order to uh, try to get around this highly unbelievable situation. Uh, infinitely many other universes, and we will never be able to see them or test this or interact in any way. Uh, so it is a huge statement of faith, much harder to believe in no God today than it is to believe in God. So these amazing coincidences, uh, just some others, constants of nature, the specific speed of light, the proton and electron mass, the uh, ratio of charge to mass, decay rates and nuclear decay, different, uh, the density of mass and energy through the universe and the amount of dark matter, all these things speak to design. 
And if you put it all together, uh, it is the closest thing to impossible that this could happen without God des designing it this way. So what takes more faith? I would say uh, to not believe in God now takes far more faith than to believe in God. Just, so just to summarize, naturalistic science is not the only kind of science, it's a particular kind. It's what we hear about most, but it is only one kind of science. It is claimed that it does away with God, but it is not the only possible approach. And it, uh, by history of science, we would say that uh, this already contradicts the claim. I have a few extra resources there, some papers that uh, can be reached at the Journal of Biblical Foundations of Faith and Learning for more things. But let's go back. Let's go back to the original question. First of all, is there a problem? And if so, who or what is the problem? And my answer is yes, there is a problem. But it's not a problem specifically with science or specifically with religion. It's not us or them. It's poor communication. It's when scientists and, and uh, believers talk past each other. And it's having different assumptions without recognizing them. If I don't examine my assumptions, then I'm not doing my job thinking. It won't be solved by Christians ignoring science or trivializing it, or just making fun of, of unbelievers, or vice versa, by uh, scientists ignoring or ridiculing religion and believers. We see both of these, and it's very sad. But better would be to try to understand where people are coming from, find some common ground. Oh, you see the amazing beauty of the universe? I see that too. And let's talk about that. And maybe that can build someone's faith to, to finally recognize there is a creator. So I, not only does the biblical worldview uh, do a better job of explaining than materialism. I would say it gives missing pieces. One missing piece is the motivation, the meaning, the purpose for doing science. You don't have those if you are a materialist. Knowledge acquired by the Christian is accompanied by awe and praise to the Creator. That's a new dimension. I would say it's like going from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. The atheistic view of studying nature, studying the universe, is, is flat. We have this extra dimension. The materialist may marvel at nature, although probably not enough, but doesn't really go beyond, gain further insights. So I, I would say materialistic science is incomplete. And I, it's... I'd have to say I feel sorry for someone who is in that flat worldview or maybe just seeing black and white without the richness of color that we can experience, lacking the motivation for doing our study, but also lacking this completing step, wonder, awe, and praise. Very quickly, I'd like to also share what I call the onion effect. I've never heard this, this phrase used anywhere else. I think I invented it. It is my view of eternally learning. Okay, so uh, some implications here. We are finite. God is infinite. So that really means I don't, I don't really expect to understand anything, everything. God made me, so I do expect to understand some. We may never completely understand everything. You hear about a theory of everything. Uh, we're on the verge of understanding everything, theory of everything. I don't believe it. I believe we look forward to the joy of continuing unfolding discovery. Creation may be infinite or it may be finite. Either way, it may have infinite detail. So infinitely large, infinitely small. And to me, that is... Uh, that's actually what I expect a little bit from infinite God. So this onion effect is I take off one level and then I find a deeper level. 
with more understanding. And it might be completely different, like the layers of the onion, each one is separate. So when I see that there are different models in science that give me more understanding, but rest on different assumptions, how, how reality works. So in relativity, that was a big change from Isaac Newton's gravitation. And in quantum physics, we have a, a different view of the universe that goes beyond. It's like a new layer of the onion. And I confidently expect this will continue. Maybe there are infinite layers, consistent and significant behavior at all levels. Always more to learn, forever new realms to study. It's exciting. It's a little more than uh, just sitting around in heaven for eternity, but it's <laughs> always being able to study, always being able to learn. We will not be limited by our few decades of earthly existence. Our study will literally never end. And Ellen White says, an education that is as high as heaven and as broad as the universe, an education that cannot be completed in this life, but will continue in the life to come, an educated education that secures to the successful student his passport, or her passport, from the preparatory school of earth, we're, we're in kindergarten here, to the higher grade, the school above, from education. We should be humble. We have only scratched the surface, and um, we have heaven and an eternity to look forward to. So this is the last piece, uh, the missing dimension. When we study God's creation, we should experience wonder, awe, and heartfelt praise. And we can uh, say with the psalmist, I will meditate on your wonderful works. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. Ellen White says, all true science is but an interpretation of the handwriting of God in the material world. Science brings from her research only fresh evidences of the wisdom and power of God. Rightly understood, both the book of nature and the written word make us acquainted with God by teaching us something of his wise and beneficent laws through which he works. And I think that's a good place for us to stop. Thank you so much for your attention. And I saw on the schedule that we have time for talking a little bit. It's a discussion. I think that means people will talk. But let's, uh, let's have a prayer just uh, to close this part. Lord, we come before you again. We stand in awe of your amazing creation. And most of all, that you have given us the ability to understand some of what we see. We are not part of a mindless, random process, but we are planned. And we give you the praise. And we ask that you will work out your plans in our individual lives that you can use us to reach those around us who may have, uh, through various circumstances, uh, not examined some of their assumptions, may not have seen the evidence for creation, may not have realized your love for each of us. We thank you and we ask you to keep working through us and in us. Amen. Yeah, one thing we want to do is uh, have a time for questions and answers. He's given, thank you for some very valuable information. We want to also have a time for anybody to ask questions. If you have any questions about what you talked about or shared or how we should approach different things, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. And, uh, hmm? I have a son who's a uh, biology teacher in high school. He, uh, he grew up in the academies, but then he went... Then he went to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga mm -hmm. to get his college degree, and then as a result, drifted way off. Mm. And uh, I have not challenged him in any way about his beliefs or anything, but he has been pretty adamant in his conversation with me about how science is one thing and religion is another. And mm. and uh, so my... Uh, my question is, how 
would you suggest that I approach him? Sometimes it's pretty difficult for fathers to to convince their <laughs> children, but uh, I do pray for him every day. I think that's the most important. We have to pray for each other, and um, I think that the danger is if if we come in an argumentative spirit, then we can do more damage than help sometimes. I would agree there. I, I have a I had a very good friend who turned completely away from all belief in God and uh, accused me of being stupid and, and uh, backwards because I still, you still believe that stuff? Uh, he didn't say that. He didn't use those words. It was uh, less pleasant. Uh, but uh, I still interacted. I reached out to him. I showed my, my interest in keeping a friendship going. And I prayed. And I don't know what the outcome will be. But um, I do think it's useful to see the consistency of the biblical worldview. We are not back in, uh, in the Dark Ages just uh, taking whatever the priest tells us. God asks us to think for ourselves. And guess what? When I think carefully through these things, I see that the, the worldview from the Bible makes sense. Do you, um, have you written any books or anything that, that might be something good to give to him? Or I know I wrote down The Privileged Planet. That's a very, in, uh, a very good book to, um, to show how the universe looks designed, and the earth especially. It is a challenge to the idea that things could happen by chance. Um, I also recommend the books of Nancy Percy. I did a couple of quotes here from Nancy Percy, who shows that uh, logically we can be, we can believe in God. We're not just hiding from uh, from our reasonable explanations. How do you spell her last name? P E A R C E Y. Nancy Percy. Actually, she's spoken here at, at our campus at Southern a couple of times. Oh, really? I see. Um, okay. And some very powerful ideas. But I should warn you, uh, I have to read her books twice. <laughs> because the first time through, uh, I didn't get it at all. And I also mentioned Francis Schaeffer, uh, who is probably... When I, when I was in a period of uh, doubt myself... I went back and I read Francis Schaeffer and I read, read The Great Controversy to see the pattern behind what we, what we experience. It does make sense. People say, how can you believe in God? Uh, because I see such evil in the world. Now I say, how can you not believe in God? I see such good in the world. And I also see evil. I also see brokenness. That's all explained in The Great Controversy. So if you, if you were uh, ruling out God, actually, that's not a complete explanation. They can't explain good, they can't explain beauty, and really they can't explain a difference between good and evil. So um, not that we want to get into an argument, but I do think it's important to see that our faith is strong and it's based on solid, rational, reasonable thinking. God asks us to have faith, but it is a faith based on evidence he gives. It's not a blind faith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, understanding that there will always need to be, uh, especially the foundation for faith. We can't absolutely prove to everyone else that, you know, God exists. Right. But I would like to hear one example from you, from the science aspect, something that proves to you specifically that there is a creator without mm -hmm. a shadow of a doubt mm -hmm. uh, to you personally. Okay. What is something that you could prove that there's no room for uh, any other theories, but for you personally, uh, what would be one example of that? Okay, thank you. Um, 
I will say that I have experienced miracles personally, and uh, that I do not list as the reason that I believe in God, because I think I can be deceived, I can be confused, I can, um, I can be misled, and so I do find it, it's a little bit, uh, <laughs> I have to laugh at myself, because God has, several times I can see, saved my life. And I say, oh, God must still have a reason for me to be around. He must have, have a work for me to do still. And then I find myself thinking, could that be explained by coincidence? So this is the, this is the constant back and forth, which all of us probably experience at one time or another. But um, I began to realize that the only reason I doubted God was a misunderstanding of science. I have been enthralled by science and understanding the universe since I was a child. And it's, uh, it's fun to talk about it too, so this is why I'm, in, I'm supposed to be a science teacher. But I began to, I had the misunderstanding that if I understand how something works, then there doesn't need to be a designer for it. And that was just a very common theme. People say, oh, science explains everything. We don't need God. That is a misunderstanding. I can, like I said, I could understand a radio or a car or understand how something is built, but I may not be able to do it myself. In fact, I'm not able to do it myself. So maybe I can just understand parts of it. But it still had to have a creator. It had to have a designer. And more and more, and I would say over, over the, each year, we find more and more that things can't have just happened. So the privileged planet is just one example. And I would say the laws of nature, the laws that the universe follow, uh, you can't just have those pop how to pop into existence from nothing. Even before there's any matter or anything in the universe, God had to make the laws of physics so that it would, it would work. Uh, today, we also talk about information theory. There has to be information put into something that requires an agent, it requires a, a mind. I'd say more and more, we have reason to believe in design. Uh, and, of course, God does not uh, remove all possibility of doubt, but yet he does add more and more evidence that we can rely on. So I don't know that I have uh, a simple answer for you, but those are some of the pieces. I usually hear most um, materialists uh, pretty much deny the idea of free will. Mm -hmm. um, are there any materialists, uh, truly secular materialists, that, that try to accommodate the two ideas of, mm -hmm. of actual free will um, in a completely materialistic, um, and what, what is their approach to that, if there's anything? Uh, thank you for that question. My own reading leads me to believe that most people don't follow through to the logical conclusions. And so uh, they may give lip service to the idea of no free will, but still they act like they have choice, right? So they still act like they are free agents and they can choose, I want to have this type of cereal for breakfast and not this type, I make choices. And they may say, oh, I was probably just uh, making that, I, it's an illusion of free will. But they don't act like that. In fact, I read something recently, uh, a very, very uh, outspoken materialistic philosopher said, um, when my daughter runs up to me, daddy, daddy, and gives me a hug, I realize that this is just the biological uh, actions of uh, random processes, but I still have to give her a hug. <laughs> so how sad is that? 
a lack of all meaning. So um, I, would, I don't think that it's primarily a situation where someone um, has found a way to have free will despite being a materialist. I think they just re refuse to think about it. Uh, this is an interesting start to the seminar. Um, one thing that concerns me, uh, I guess, more so these days than, say, agnostics or atheists who, you know, deny, well, they have a materialistic explanation for things. Instead of that, you see so many shows that are dealing with, uh, you know, ancient aliens mm -hmm. or intelligences that are far in advance of what human humanity would be and uh, you know people who believe that are saying oh well that's that's the reason why mm. things exist so we have a designer they have a designer <laughs> now that's that that becomes a more difficult problem than in a way than than with uh, you know dealing with people who are you know, not believing because of agnosticism or atheism, in my opinion. Very good point. Uh, in fact, there are some of the uh, loudest voices in, in uh, looking at the design in the universe say, well, uh, I don't, I see it's designed, but I don't, I still don't have to believe in God. So I find another way. And whether it's, uh, superhuman aliens or some other explanation, uh, I would just say that that is putting the problem back uh, one level and there's, there's not enough time in the, since the beginning of the universe to have our, uh, our life and what we see here. And I would say it's even less possible for uh, superhuman aliens to be there. They even get as detailed as saying, well, they also, you know, genetically engineered us, you know, yeah. from this or from that or the other, yeah. you know. It, yeah, the, it gets pretty detailed. Sure. And there is, um, there's a human tendency to latch on to these cute explanations. It's, we're definitely seeing those. I would say it's part of the great controversy that uh, preparing us to, uh, to be deceived by demonic, by evil angel appearances and so on, I don't think this is coincidence. And I don't see that uh, a superhuman creator who's not God solves any, uh, any of my philosophical problems. But it does raise uh, some scary possible uh, possibilities there. Yeah, good point. I, I grew up with science as a materialistic science challenging my faith. But as you say, there are other challenges today. There really are. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned the assumptions of naturalism, mm -hmm. and that's a very big problem, of course. Mm -hmm. um, what have you, or how have you found it effective to help people acknowledge that they are making assumptions of mm. naturalism. Because it's one thing for me to say it, right. and I've said it many times, but then it's much, much more difficult to get them to realize and recognize, yes, oh, I'm making assumptions here. How do you get them to recognize that they're making assumptions that's, that's a problematic yeah. and not following truth? Well, I know there's some times when we all are not aware of our assumptions. It, it's just a human condition. And we have to keep coming back and looking again. I, my faith is strong, but I need to look at some of the foundation. I, it's good for me to keep re-examining, not because I'm looking, I'm doubting, but I need to see the pieces that are part of the part of my faith. And I think it's uh, it's part of being humble. It's part of uh, thinking carefully and uh, with humility. But um, if if I'm trying to point out someone else's hidden assumptions, I think one of the best things is some carefully posed questions, which 
come at it a little bit differently and make someone reevaluate, re reconsider. And that would take some, some careful skill. I don't know that I personally am good at that. When I was young, I argued a lot, and I decided that never convinced anyone. <laughs> but um, now I would, I think my, at least for myself, uh, the way forward is to find common ground and then ask, where does that lead to? What, what would be the results of this? If we follow through, what, what does that mean? Or where could that come from? We could work both ways back to some assumptions. And uh, treating, treating our, our, uh, the, our fellow human beings with respect, not, not dissing them or uh, denigrating, but uh, just entering into a conversation. And I think that also means that the person you're talking to will begin to treat you with respect also. Thank you. Is there one last question or anyone? Any last questions? No? Okay, I guess thank you very much. Well, I really we'll, appreciate we'll the chance here. to join you okay. for the beginning of this weekend, special time, and I pray that God will bless us all as we consider and you look at the schedule, many different aspects of God's creation, and um, we give him the praise. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I really encourage you to study what he has said because if you look at media, they're often saying, oh, religion and science are at war. But the history of science shows that it was Jews and Christians who pioneered almost everything. And I was actually listening to Stephen Meyer. He's very famous. He Just uh, last week he was saying that pretty much all the field of science and they were pioneered by Christians and things like that. And so we have a very, very strong argument, argument that we actually built science <laughs> uh, in contrast to what the media says. And a lot of other good things there. Fine-tuning is such an important, important area and proof like that and a lot of other things like that. But thank you all for coming. We're going to close the prayer with my friend Dara here. And, uh, Kneel with me as you're able. Father God, we're very thankful for this opportunity to have this creation seminar. We're thankful for the people who are presenting, who you've prepared for many years, that you've uh, planted seeds and led them and guided them and been patient with them. You say in your word, the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And we're seeing that unfolding. I'm very thankful for learning and, and seeing and, and my faith being more and more strengthened as we see your character at work more and more. I pray for this seminar that uh, people will come. They'll come out, they'll listen and be open-minded. And for each speaker that we would have courage to say the truth, not be afraid, and that you will protect us from the enemy who doesn't want this to be a success. Thank you very much. In Jesus' name, amen. We just want to welcome you to join us this evening. And so I know tomorrow we will have more to uh, go. You know, So thank you very much. And I read this is very powerful. Give us a lot of insights to think to take uh, home. You know, So tomorrow we we'll start 9.30. 9.30. So 9.30. And so as a matter of fact, tomorrow a whole day program going on you know so and you don't want to miss that so try to invite people you know so whoever join us online and so and please stay until like tomorrow we'll still have all the seminar and a presentation start from 9 30 here and thank you very much and god bless you and i'll see you guys tomorrow okay